momentarily. And uh, I assume I am pointing the right way for you, uh, Molly. That's Molly Visk over there in the corner. I can see Hi. Molly. And to what do I owe the pleasure of having Molly join us? So uh, it's good for me. I, I find it really helpful to have an audience as if I'm actually speaking with people. And it, I find that it, it keeps me like, you know, on the, you know, out of the ditches a little bit. And uh, I also asked her to ask like typical questions that a young architect might ask because she's young and she's an architect. And uh, if we go into the weeds too deeply, she's supposed to, you know, smack us in the head and drag us out, <laughs> put us back on the road. So uh, anyway, and so Molly, that's uh, Christy there uh, of Building Science Fight Club. She's uh, joining us from Dallas, Texas. Hey, Molly. I'm a huge fan of your Instagram. Oh, account. I'm so glad you like it. As soon as Foster told me about that, I went down a deep dive and just, I love it. <laughs> so Christy, just so you know, this is a, a policy of, of my podcast. I only invite Notre Dame School of <laughs> valedic Valedictorians. Oh, wow. All right. <laughs> yes. So Molly's also a valedictorian from her year, which was like last year or something like that. Endorsement. Thank you, Foster. Well, that is pretty astounding. I mean, I know they have a valedictorian every year, but still. Yeah, there's many of us. <laughs> yeah, but it's pretty... I was a straight C student through architecture school. I barely made it. So <laughs> people like you helped me pass. <laughs> and you're, you're still at Ferguson Shimami, right, Molly? Correct. So Just Ferguson. have my four year anniversary. Wow. Okay. So uh, my guess is Dr. Stebrick there has worked with Ferguson Shimami in the past. Um, but for Christie's sake, um, Ferguson Shimami is a, I would call it a national level firm. Uh, they're in the AD 100. They have been plenty of times over the years headquartered in New York, but realistically they work around the world. Vast majority of the work seems to be, uh, you know, single family residential, but Molly may be able to straighten me out no, on some of that. We're still in the residential category. We're actually the largest only residential firm in the country now. Wow. wow. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Mark, the talk at Notre Dame and threw that figure out and we were all surprised to know it but apparently yes it's true oh. well how big are you um, there's about, about 90 of us wow it's crazy that 90 is the biggest I mean I guess that I know sense, we're, but... yeah there's most single family residential right. friends are much smaller so. yeah yeah and that is Dr. Uh, Stebrick in the the relaxing chair there. He looks like a real <laughs> studious fellow with books and everything. And like, a, what was that cartoon when I was a kid with a guy who had the globe next to him? Uh, looks sort of like that. The Explorers Club. I think he's coming to us from the Explorers Club. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I'll try to introduce Dr. Stebrick a little bit. He is uh, the, the founder and president of, uh, or not the president, maybe he is, I don't know certainly the founder of Building Science Corporation. He's considered the dean of uh, North American building science. I don't know why they limited it to North America, um, but he's, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the, the, the number one uh, most qualified, most talented, and uh, busiest building scientist in North America. And he's certainly been a great help to me, and I've learned pretty much everything I've learned in building science from him. So you're, you're, you're insanely kind and thank you. <laughs> um, He's also my dad. <laughs> yeah, yes. Molly, that is, uh, that is father and daughter there. So it's great. Anyway, thought she looks like her mother. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you everybody for uh, spending your time and uh, doing this for the ICAA. Um, that's the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art. Molly and I are pretty active uh, members in New York. Uh, I really like the organization. I hope uh, you two uh, also can spend some time there and whatever in the future, whenever the world ever comes back to normal. Um, 
they asked me to put these podcasts together uh, and that's what this is all about. They're going to edit them at some point and publish them, but I really don't know what their timeline is. And we have to record, right? Yes, we are supposed to okay. record. Like individually. So dad, yeah. you too. I probably have to give everybody <laughs> permission. I think I have that. permission already. Oh, no, 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 I don't. You. Oh, I'm sorry. You're at the bottom of the at the bottom of your screen if you put your mouse uh, down to the bottom of the screen it'll have participants chat share screen and then record and you'll have to click on record I'm clicking on record all right and good to go there you go what's happening yeah you're good and then when it <laughs> that's remarkable when you, when it's over, you know, your computer's going to tell you, hey, we're, it's basically like, you know, stockpiling this file onto your computer. Hopefully then you rename the file a little bit. I sent the instructions on that. And then you have to drop it into a Dropbox so that it gets to the ICAA and they can then, whatever they do with it. Well, so I'm going to have to find an eight-year-old to help me do this. I'll it? help you, Dad. <laughs> fine. Fine. Molly, you're on your own. <laughs> I think I yeah. got this one. <laughs> the valedictorian can handle it. <laughs> uh, the anyway. PhD is going to need some help, though. <laughs> so to, tonight, yeah. Tonight's topic is uh, wine storage rooms. Uh, and I, I want to start with a question for Dr. Stebrick. Um, I, I find this confusing because, uh, I, I know, I like wine as much as anybody. But I always thought the wine storage room was that space right behind your belly button. So <laughs> what, what's with this the whole room for wine? Talk to us. Well, we need a whole room for wine because uh, once it gets behind your belly button, it goes through a chemical and biological transformation. So uh, we don't want that chemical and biological transformation to happen to the bottle until it happens in you. So we need to store the wine under conditions that allow us to insanely enjoy it when we want to insanely enjoy it. And uh, it's kind of a, an interesting story of, of where recommendations and guidance comes from. And uh, I, I, I love wine. I'm, I'm not a wine expert. I'm an expert wine drinker, but I'm not a wine expert. But I know a great deal about how to store wine. Um, and basically, it comes out of history. The classic storage conditions for wine are the red wine, are 55 degrees Fahrenheit at a rate of humidity of 70% to 80%. And well, where the hell did that number the numbers come from? <laughs> That's the typical conditions of a basement in Burgundy, France, <laughs> or the Rhone, France. So you dig a you dig a hole in in France in the wine district, and you build a building on top of it. The conditions under the building in the ground are around fifty five degrees Fahrenheit, seventy five seventy to eighty percent relative humidity. So we stored wine historically in, in those conditions. Now, over the last uh, 100 years, we've been lowering the relative humidity requirements slightly, and you're going to laugh when I tell you what the reason is. What is the most important, valuable thing for wine? The label on the bottle. <laughs> can't we, label. Can't we just print, print some new labels? <laughs> yeah, well, that's the problem. We want the original freaking label. People want to know what's in the damn bottle. You're going to have a 1950 bottle, you know, a spectacular vineyard in Burgundy, and it doesn't have a label on it. Nobody knows what's in the freaking bottle, not in the freaking bottle. So we want to make sure that the label doesn't get moldy. And so keeping the condition of the label in condition is what limits a lot of the freaking conditions that we have to store the wine at. It's, 
It's insane. So and these are really paper storage rooms? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Yes, yeah, <laughs> they are. And in fact, what people are now trying, people for a long time, um, since the 20s and 30s, wrap their expensive bottles in cell cellophane. So, so, so cellophane was basically uh, a semi-plastic kind of a thingy that was transparent. And we wrapped the bottles to protect the paper label. I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. Today, we should, you know, print on, you know, plastic and glue the plastic thingy with the whatever on the bottle. But you're going to find in most um, wine storage places, cellars or whatever, in the best restaurants and the most expensive residential buildings and wherever in the world, they're wrapped in plastic to protect the label so it doesn't get moldy. And so we know that uh, with the Kelvin equation and capillary continuity, um, that about between 70 and 80 percent relative humidity is where we have capillary condensation and paper surfaces. We learn just look at drywall. You know, we we don't want drywall to see more than 70 to 75 percent relative humidity because we get mold. We don't want our wine bottle labels to see more than 70 75 percent relative humidity so they don't get moldy. We didn't have paper labels. We would store the wine at a higher relative humidity. Would we? Why? I mean, they're in bottles. Does the, I can see the temperature mattering, but the relative humidity, why would it, why would it matter? Well, what we want to do is provide, and this is the next part of this, it's important that we don't have a completely vapor closed seal or cork. We want transfer of moisture and oxygen in both directions. So we don't want an air barrier and vapor barrier covering. And uh, cork is perfect. It's semi-vapor permeable and not completely airtight. We don't want that. We want the wine to age. And the only way for the wine to age if, is if there's an exchange of moisture and oxygen between the bottle and the surroundings and the surroundings and the bottles but we don't want it to be very rapid. Now, it's kind of funny. Um, the Australians don't believe this to be true. So they have plastic corks because, you know, Australians are down under and they're kind of weird in a lot of ways. They play football without pads, what can I tell you? And they have insanely strong termites, but that's another story. Um, they have plastic corks and so, Australian wines don't age because once they're sealed, and if they're kept at those con at, at 55 degrees, they don't get old. They're fresh, which is not what old wine experts like to see. They would like to see it age. So, for example, an Australian Grange, <laughs> it's got a cork in it, baby. It doesn't have... <laughs> It doesn't have plastic and you actually want an exchange. Now, believe it or not, some of the wine uh, bottlers in the vineyards got overly ambitious and they wrap the top of the bottle with, you know, a lead or a metallic wrapping, right? That's the, you know, what do you call that when you- Don't pretty much all of them have foil at the top? Yeah, and is foil vapor open or vapor closed? Vapor closed. <laughs> but that's what they're doing. They're poking two holes in them. Huh. Yeah. 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 That's I never knew. I never <laughs> noticed that. That's why you hang out with Foster. And, and, and sometimes they put a paper, a, a little paper disc on the top, too. Maybe that's just to label it. Well, no, no. There isn't a paper disc on the top. They, they basically have. Um, they poke holes in them. Well, maybe I'm just not drinking as good wine, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, my wine comes in a cardboard box. What are you talking about? <laughs> so let, me, let me summarize where we are with this long story. The original conditions for wine storage occurred because of the traditional conditions 
under French chateaus in the 17 and 1800s. And then the question became, how do we protect the paper labels? That was a secondary consideration. And then we also want to have exchange of oxygen air between the bottle and the surroundings and, 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 and the other direction in order to have the wine age. So these are all considerations. So you, now, if you make things too cold, you slow down the chemical reaction. If you make them too hot, you increase the chemical reaction. So it's an Goldilocks thing, not too hot, not too cold, just right. And the just right happens to be historically pretty reasonable based on you know, the experience in, 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 in France. Now, you go to California, it's kind of interesting. They have to go to a lot of trouble to create the conditions of a wine cellar in the ground in California to match that in France. So you actually have to refrigerate the ground in California. In California, we, should, we need to build a wall. We don't. Um, uh, on the contrary, I think we should all be like San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I'm getting at is that the temperature controls the rate of reaction and the vapor tightness controls the chemical exchange to have the wine age. I mean, Foster's our resident chemical engineer and, and in terms of the rate of reaction and, and exchange, this is all Uranus stuff, the Uranus equation. But at the end of the day, 55 degrees Fahrenheit seems to be a reasonable, reasonably good temperature based on several centuries of experience and 70% relative humidity. And we wrapped up expensive stuff with, you know, with cellophane, seems to be a reasonable condition to uh, store the wine at and then poking some holes. Oh, a few more little side things. Um, the Italians and the French store their first year or two in giant wooden casks and they really, really like Serbian oak. Um, the Australians store their stuff in stainless steel. Well, you need the wood in order to make good wine. The Australians throw hunks of wood into their stainless steel. Kidding me. I don't make this stuff up. <laughs> so, I've gone into consulting, but a boom, but they basically buy the wood. But you know, if you're an engineer, Foster, like me, the Australians have really dialed this in. They really have got this figured out uh, in terms of how they, they are, are mass producing extremely good wines, but they've done it from an engineering perspective as opposed to an art and historical perspective. The French and the Italians are into this tradition stuff, except when they're not. It's like synthetic diamonds. <laughs> Well, lab lab grown diamonds. Lab grown diamonds. <laughs> Some of the synthetic diamonds look awfully freaking good. Just, no complaints. Just, just. <laughs> but anyway, so this idea of the of the wood storage is a big deal. Now, there's an awful lot of mold in um, the Italian and French traditional underground wine storage and which is kind of interesting because sometimes mold is bad and sometimes mold is good and we had a big problem in california 20 years 25 years ago when california got on this cleanliness kick and they basically went to town on killing all of the mold so that their places were being bottled the wine, they stored the wine, they did their wine manufacturing, the wine factory was mold free. Well, what ended up happening was, is that the chemicals killed the not particularly miserable molds that killed the weak molds and the molds that came back 
were real mother, whatchamacallit, efforts. And so they destroyed a lot of the mold because they basically created super species of mold that almost destroyed the California wine industry. And so we, I was part of a group that was basically tasked with trying to save some of the historic um, uh, wine buildings where they were manufactured because the French experts came in and said, you have to knock everything down to get rid of the bad mold. So what we ended up doing is we ended up building buildings inside of buildings in order to retain the historic nature of the original uh, wine building because they went to town to try to kill the mold. Not all mold is bad. And, and so if you kill the good mold, the miserable mold takes over and the miserable, miserable mold is worse than okay mold. I, I know that sounds really weird. It's kind of neat because uh, almost 150 years ago, the French wine industry almost got destroyed and it was saved by transplanting the roots of California. So 150 years ago, California saved the French wine industry. 25 years ago, uh, France saved the American wine industry. It was kind of a, an interesting reversal. So there's tremendous love and respect between French winemakers and California winemakers because each owes their existence to each other. It's kind of like when, you know, they gave us this Statue of Liberty thing in New York Harbor, you know. What can I tell you? you know, the, well, they gave us French fries too, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to give you a sense, America wouldn't have been America without Lafayette, who was a French guy. And not too many people know that Lafayette, when he passed and was buried in Paris, was buried in dirt from America. So he was buried in Paris, but he was surrounded by American dirt. And when General Pershing came to France in the First World War with his battalion um, to help the French save France, he marched his battalion to Lafayette's grave and said, Lafayette, we are here. <laughs> Big deal. It's a long-winded way of saying 55 degrees, 70 degrees, 70% 70 relative humidity. So can I follow up on, on a piece of that? Um, do you think any of this, you know, mold warfare is going on in our typical home? Or, or it's always going on to some degree, but do you think we're tipping it one way or the other for any, you know, any reason at the moment? Well, I, I, I think that what's happening is, is that in colder climates in the winter months, we're operating our houses at in our buildings at a higher relative humidity that they're able that they're actually able to handle. And I think we're we're pushing them into failure territory. And that's because um, there's no such thing as a free thermodynamic lunch. We're we're making our buildings more thermally efficient, so we're reducing the energy exchange. We're making them significantly more airtight, which means that the interior moisture levels are going up and that moisture is going from the inside out, you know, from warm to cold and more to less, you know, second law of thermodynamics going right in your face. Well, when older buildings got wet, they dried because they are energy pigs. Drying is an energy exchange process. Well, when we reduce the energy exchange, the drying takes much longer. So what we're doing is we're increasing the dwell time for water in the assemblies. So we're making the buildings both wetter while we're also reducing their ability to dry. This is not a, this is not a good thing. We have to change the way that we build our buildings to allow them to handle the higher interior moisture load and the lower drying potential because of the energy efficiency. When we take an old historic building and we improve it by wanting to make it more energy efficient and more airtight, nothing is for free. If we're going to reduce the drying potential because of improving the energy efficiency, 
we have to intervene and reduce the wedding potential. <laughs> a lot of wetting in historic buildings comes from rain absorption, rain from the outside and the ground being wet. Well, it's kind of hard to intervene with rainwater absorption in our historic facades in a way that nobody notices that there, we were there. If you look at, uh, and by the way, this is not a new problem. If you look at Notre Dame and the one in Montreal is the one, as well as the one in Paris, if you look at our older buildings, we've historically intervened with regleted lead drips and caps on our facades to increase drainage and dripping away from the facade to reduce surface tension issues. This is going to be even more necessary if we try to make them more energy efficient. <coughs> For a building to stand a long time, a historic building, we have to change some of the external appearance. It would be nice to do this in such a way that nobody, that civilians don't know that we are here and that the way that we do it is reversible, easy to say, difficult to achieve without irritating or annoying somebody. Hold on. Molly, <coughs> is, are, are the architects going to allow the building scientists to, to make a change to the how the facade looks? If you looks? do it exactly like he said, where you can't notice, then yeah, we're all for <laughs> okay. it. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's funny though. I did a... Um, I did a piece uh, this weekend on through wall flashings. So essentially in any time that we're building with a veneer, so we've got some sort of structure and then I was using the example of a masonry veneer in front of that. Uh, you have a water control layer on the structure and then you have to provide some mechanism for water that reaches the water control layer to drain to the exterior. Uh, using through wall flashings. And I got so many comments from architects who were like, wait, what? No, 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 no. Uh, and I showed some examples of some people who had done this um, poorly and some who had done it very well. And of course, my photos were zoomed in, right? So I'm looking like I have an enlarged view of the actual through wall flashing, which of course, when you're <laughs> when you look right at it, people are like, well, I do definitely don't want that on my building. But I really think that you can, um, you, can uh, you can do this in a way that makes it a lot less, uh, less noticeable in the context of the entire building. And my response to a lot of these architects was, uh, look, you, can, you could build a mass building instead of doing a masonry veneer. But there's, as my dad was saying, there's if you're going to make a trade-off, you have to it, you have to remember that it goes both ways. If you want the veneer instead of the mass structure, for all of the reasons associated with that, lower cost, um, you know, quicker construction time, all that stuff, there's a there's a penalty. There's a bit of an aesthetic penalty to pay with that, in that you have to accommodate uh, drainage and drying in a different way. And there are aesthetic there are more and less aesthetically pleasing ways of, of doing that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think when you show somebody a picture of flashing, especially if it's stainless steel, stainless steel is particularly offensive on historic buildings. I don't really like the look on any building, but um, you sw swap it out for a lead coated copper uh, that starts to look a lot more minimal, even on a, even on a beautiful old masonry building. I don't know, what do you think, Molly? Is What do you guys use? when? I would agree, I would agree. I think that there's a lot of clever tricks that you can do, put it in a shadow line so you don't see it. And I think we have to be willing to work with the recommendations from a scientist who knows the building will fail if we don't do that. Because um, ultimately no architect should want the building to fail. Um, I did have a question, wine related. Well, I would go for it. When like you had our, said that the ideal conditions for the wine was a certain temperature and relative humidity, is that the same? Because we have clients that want, you know, a special place for their reds, their whites, their sparkling. Like, is there a difference from a building standpoint of what, why that is? Yeah, the, the whites tend to taste better when they're colder. So um, I'm not a real fan of, of white wine. I would 
rather put sand in my eyes than drink white wine. But <laughs> so you just tell the client, like, no. <laughs> so you, you, you need to store the, the whites at a colder temperature. Um, and so you store the whites differently than you store uh, uh, the reds. Um, the uh, champagnes even, even more so. So you typically have basically three, three different temperature regimes. And if you're going to do a wine room, I mean, it's typically, let's say you, you want to entertain in your wine cellar. There are people that want that. Well, you're going to have, your primary temperature is going to be 55 degrees, 70% relative humidity. But your whites are going to have their own part of the room and they're going to be in an enclosure or refrigerator that's going to be at a colder temperature. And so you can't, you're going to have to isolate them. And that's just, just the way it is. So your whites are typically stored differently than your reds. Apparently, uh, you know, white wine matters. So how do we isolate, how do you, if you're going to, um, if you're going to isolate, create this enclosure within the building enclosure and you need to create different conditions in that enclosure, um, how do you, from a design perspective, how do you do that? Does it have to, all of these walls have to be on the interior? Can some of them, can, can some of this, can you build a wine room on an exterior wall? Uh, do you have to, you know, do you want to be insulating the floor? The, I imagine you don't want humid air escaping. So how do you, what are the, what are the rules? The ground rules? Well, you, first thing that you have to ask yourself is, where are you? Are we in Naples, Florida, Naples, Italy, or Naples, Illinois? All right, so we need to know what part of the country that we're in. And the second thing that we need to know is, are we building this in the middle of the space that's surrounded by interior conditions, or are we putting it against an exterior wall or an exterior part of the foundation? And so what we're basically needing to do is figure out what the boundary conditions are. And the moment we know what the boundary conditions are, it becomes pretty darn becomes pretty darn easy. Then the question is going to be: Do we want to? Are we going to have people actually in the wine space enjoying the wine, or is it just going to be for the wine? If we have people in the space, we have to give them air. <laughs> we don't have to give the wine a lot of air. I. Uh, my all-time favorite place to drink wine is a restaurant in Toronto called Barbarians. They, not after the people who are barbaric, but after very barbarian. And they've got, you know, 100,000 bottles in this big hole in the ground where they can have 30 people. Well, that's complicated because 30 people need probably around 15 CFM per person while they're there. And you're going to have to recondition that air change in order to maintain the conditions, not to screw up the, the wine. It's kind of neat to have you know people come in in short black dresses and heels. I find that very difficult myself personally, by the way. <laughs> but before you before you condition the air a particular way, you have to enclose it. So how do you do the enclosure? Okay, so what I'm getting at is that. You need to be completely airtight, but you have to decide whether you want to be under a positive pressure or a negative or a neutral pressure. It's a lot easier if you just store wine and not have people in the space. Then we want a minimal exchange of air at a neutral pressure. It would be nice to filter the incoming air because we don't want nasty stuff to come in and out. Now, to me, the easiest is to have a six-sided cube in the middle of a space that's surrounded by 70 to 75 degree Fahrenheit air at somewhere between 30 to 60 relative humidity. That's easy. That, you know, <laughs> I build a 
I'd build a box and I'd use semi-vapor permeable insulation. My favorite would be extruded polystyrene, blue or pink or green. And I would have at least two layers with the joints offset horizontally and vertically. And I would line it with plywood on the inside and plywood on the outside. No OSB in my six-sided cube. And then I would, I happen to like wood. Wood doesn't get irritated at 55 degrees Fahrenheit, 70% relative humidity. Wood's, wood's gonna be insanely happy. I then put my wood lining on furring. I'd have an air gap between my wood lining and my plywood. And then I'd have a tile floor because I tend to drop bottles of wine. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to clean a tile floor or a stone floor than it is to clear clean a wood floor. But you want your floor insulated also. So this six-sided box, the insulation lines up, right? Six-sided. But I'd have I'd have tile or, or 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 wood on my floor. I prefer tile or stone. Then I'd have uh real wood on the walls and my ceiling, and then absolutely for real wood, wood shelves. And I'd, I'd, I'd want somebody who knew aesthetics on how to lay it all out. But my, my two layers of, of extruded polystyrene, each layer would be taped and sealed. My plywood would be masticed on both the inside and the outside. And so what I've got is a, a very low vapor transmission from the inside out and the outside in, but it's not a perfect vapor barrier. It can dry slowly in both directions. And then I'd have a mechanical system that is insanely quiet that I can dial in my temperature independently of my humidity. So I have a box that controls temperature, a machine that controls temperature and a machine that controls humidity and then a third machine that controls air change. Let me tell you a little bit about engineers. We're born with a genetic defect that requires therapy and many years to overcome. The genetic defect is the integration. We can't help ourselves. We want one machine that freaking does everything. No temperature, humidity, and it's a control sequence nightmare. You have to step back and say the temperature machine doesn't communicate with the humidity machine, which doesn't communicate with the ventilation machine. They are each independent. They are as efficient as possible at controlling temperature efficient as possible at controlling humidity and efficient as possible in controlling air change. The moment you confuse them, you make compromises. So they are purpose built pieces of equipment. And if you go on the internet and you look at the stuff that's being sold, you can tell the people who know what they're doing because they figured it out. We've uncoupled as opposed to coupled. By the way, Doctor, do you mind? That principle, by the way, Foster holds true for the best houses and buildings oh, yeah. on the planet. Yes. Yeah. I, I wasn't going to go there, but I'll go there <laughs> next. Um, so, the humidity control portion, I'm not crazy in thinking you have to be able to both humidify and dehumidify, which is, again, not even a single piece of equipment. Today. Yeah, right? right? That's exactly right. And, and, and now you've got this aha moment. Oh my God, this isn't easy. You have to ask yourself, is the wine worth it? <laughs> the wine that I drunk early in my career was not worth it. <laughs> Think about this. What you're doing, it's how you're doing a museum, how you're going to preserve the magnificent artwork evidenced in the wine. 
for the magnificent artwork in your tapestry, for the magnificent artwork in your paintings. All right, museums, what we're creating are, are museum conditions to preserve the art and the skill of the wine. And people don't appreciate that. Now, if you're just a hack like me, drinking a four-year-old Barolo, you know, come on. But you're, you got a 19. <laughs> so wait, so you can just have a glass room that looks like the wine room, but doesn't have all the fancy controls? <laughs> just the glass has to be cold when you touch it. That's right, that's right. <laughs> exactly, we, we, we call that plastic surgery. <laughs> <laughs> hey, whatever. Don't knock it. <laughs> well, that, that's a legit uh, item of discussion, probably for uh, you know. I got to assume the audience for this podcast is architects, and that's they probably should be having that conversation with their clients. Like, what are you after here? Are you preserving, you know, true assets that you know may may sit there for twenty years and you want them to appreciate, or are you just looking for? An entertainment Look. room. Yeah. It's a, a rec room with but, wine racks. But guess what? This is, a, this is a discussion that doesn't happen as often as it should. If you've got a slate of 1945 first growths, by the way, that not only did we win the war against the Nazis, but that was the best year in the history of French wines. Hmm. Um, I wasn't born yet. But I'm just telling you, that that's special. <laughs> that's not, you know, Billy Bob and Guido's, you know. Not, not 2017 French wine? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm drinking. That bottle. I'm drinking that bottle. <laughs> then, you ask, then you have to ask your question. And you have, I, mean, I ask these questions all the time. Uh, well, not all the time, but when I'm involved with some of these interesting projects. So are you gonna drink the wine in the place that you store the wine? And that's complicated because you're going to be uncomfortable <laughs> if yeah. you get dressed up. I was just laughing at, you know, we, we have a black tie affair at, at Barbarians and I explained to people, they have to bring jackets because it's really freaking cold. It's 55 degrees, 70 percent relative humidity. You're not comfortable except if you're a French Bordeaux bottle. Can't they put in some radiant heaters in the ceiling? <laughs> Keep the wine out of radiation. Ay, ay, ay. So, Molly, you must have been through some of these conversations. Uh, I, how many, how many, what percentage do you think of the designs that go out of your office have a, 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 some variety of wine storage room in them? I'd say the vast majority of houses do. Apartments tend to obviously not have as many, just given on yeah. the space constraints. But I think a lot of clients, we do have the conversation about whether you want to be in the room with the wine or just store the wine. And I think the tr True collectors of the wine generally don't entertain in there. They keep the room pristine and in the right conditions for the wine. And then somewhere in the middle ground, you have people that are concerned with that, but also want to be in the space. And a lot of times there's a compromise where there'll be a glassed in portion that's more controlled and you'll be outside looking at it, or there'll be cabinets that are refrigerated that you can open to get the wine. Um, and then you have some that just truly want to be in the 55 degree room and have that experience in their house. How many of them ask for fireplaces in the wine room? <laughs> I don't have, I don't think we've had any of those requests. Really? Wow. Okay. No, but it is true. Psychologically, I think most people also understand the origin story of being in the basement somewhere and wine cellars typically are in the cellar. You have very few people who want a wine room on any level other than the basement. So, um, Dr. Stebrick's assembly, I love it. And it's the same one I recommend, not because I thought of it, but because, you know, he wrote it down and I studied it and, and plagiarized it. Um, but I, 
you know, it's a little thicker than your typical wall. So I always have to have that conversation with every design professional, like, hey, early on in the design, like, okay, if you're thinking of a wine storage room here, allow a few extra inches for this wall, um, which they don't usually like too much, but, you know, they're usually not passive houses either. So they, if, if you're going for a wine room, they normally are a little accommodating, but so what's the what's the risk? What happens when you get this wrong? Well, here's the thing that I'm I have to be very careful to be perfectly politically correct here. But what if you want a low carbon footprint? And there's basically a holy war against foam insulations. Can we make this work with mineral wool or rock wool? And the answer is yeah, but now your plywood box on the inside and the outside has to be freaking perfect. And you need to ventilate the inside lining, which we're going to do anyway, but you have to ventilate the outside lining as well. Whoa, 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 whoa. hold on, hold on, slow down. You can say that loud and slow so I really understand it. You have to ventilate the outside lining. I may need a sketch to understand what the outside lining is. Well, what happens, you've got plywood and you're going to now put it in Naples, Florida, for gosh sakes. And it, you know, might want to, it might want to dry in both directions. Well, I want a vapor barrier on the outside. Well, okay, but if I'm now in, you know, somewhere else, like I'm in Minnesota, I don't want a vapor barrier on the outside because the moisture is going to want to go from the inside to the outside. You know? with two layers of extruded polystyrene with the joints offset horizontally and vertically, <laughs> it's not a problem. Replace that with four inches of mineral wool. Yeah, okay. Two layers of polystyrene, two inches each layer or one inch? Each layer is gonna be two inches. I mean, come on, let's, 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 let's do this well. Let's, you know. <laughs> well, wait a second, wait a second though. Could you do it with, with one inch? Cause two inches is um, like people, you, now you need a lot more room to make this happen. I want four inches. I want our freaking 20, okay? Okay, all right. <laughs> Where the hell did I get that number? I pulled it out of my butt, but it's a cute butt. It's been around. My butt has been everywhere. And that, it doesn't seem to work very well. It's hard to control. And, and guess what? The power goes up, especially now that the grid is so unreliable because of all the wind and the solar. Oh, come on, that was really funny. Nobody's laughing. <laughs> you got to give it a little time. You got to say you got to say the joke slower next time. <laughs> I'm, I'm loving. I'm I'm now into resiliency. But why? Well, because the power is not reliable anymore. Like, yeah, I want more insulation. I want it. I want all these things. Same thing for your wine. A resilient well, wine storage. Another good reason is it's it's the wine room is normally right next to the boiler room, which is about 105 degrees. And <laughs> <laughs> that's true. All right, so let's, so here's here's what ends up happening. So we end up putting it in the basement against an exterior wall. Yeah, that was going to be my next question, by the way. So here's my advice: assume that the freaking basement wall is going to leak. Put a drainage mat or a dimple sheet or something between anything that you build like this that's expensive against the interior of an exterior wall, right? Give me an interior drain. Build it like a Swiss tunnel, for gosh sakes. Assume that the sucker is gonna leak. Then build things to the inside. Then do your rigid insulation with the two layers and then the plywood. And so if you're doing this, let's, let's talk through that. So let's say we're putting a wine room in a basement um, if we're, and we're putting it against one exterior basement wall. Uh, first, let's talk about the floor. So we wanna insulate the wine room which means we're gonna have to elevate the floor of the wine room. So you're gonna have to step up into it that's no, right. you, no, no, no. You, you, you planned this out ahead of time. You depress so you the can, slab. So you depress area. the slab. Okay, so you depress the slab, so you, but you have to insulate 
Uh, so you insulate underneath the floor of the wine room, and then at the at the the walls that are inboard, we we know we've got the the plywood sandwich uh, extruded polystyrene with center with plywood on on each end. Um, but the wall, let's talk about the wall that's that we share with the exterior. So assume that wall is is properly. Uh, we're building new construction, so we've got drainage mount on the outside of that wall. We're water managing on the outside. Do you still recommend water management on the on the inside of that wall? What does that What does that section look like through the? Uh... I, I I don't believe I always recommend water management on the outside, but I believe in belt suspenders and clean underwear, multiple systems redundancy. So I put a drainage mat on the inside and underneath. And I put up a layer of plywood and I mechanically attach the plywood through the drainage mat, through the, through the dimple sheet. And then I put two layers of rigid insulation, dry soft set horizontally and vertically, another layer of plywood. And I screw the whole thing, the inner plywood through the rigid insulation to the outer plywood. So I'm basically constructing this layer. So I've got concrete, drainage mat or dimple mat, plywood, two layers of ins rigid insulation, plywood, everything screwed together, airtight, vapor tight, and then I put my interior finish basically on furring strips. On like furring strips. Like if you have water that does leak through and that's why you have the drainage mat on the inside, where does that drain to? Oh, there I is was water. totally <laughs> going to ask that question. <laughs> Well, what you do is you put in something called a floor drain. <laughs> wait, Look wait, 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 but, but this is outside of, so you're, you're draining though, you've got drainage mat on the inside of a, of a below grade wall. Right. Uh, what you do is, and you basically would slope that to a floor drain, to, a, to any floor drain, right? Your slab is going to be sloped to a floor drain. If Foster, if you depress it, you're going to put your floor drain underneath. Yeah. And, and you do room, this, no. but you do this, are you doing this only in your wine room? Or are you doing, are you now, are we now having to put drainage mat on the entire, entirety of the basement? No, just, just, just in the wine room. Just in the wine room. And here's the fun part. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> you're going to have to keep the trap wet. Yeah, that's code. No problem. Otherwise, it's stinky. <laughs> Why is it stinky, stinky, stinky? <laughs> <laughs> no me gusta. <laughs> so I, I also, I think there's actually a, like, that. I think everything you just described is great, but you might have a difficult time convincing some designers. But I, I think you could pitch another thing at them um, that may convince them. Uh, you know, all that new concrete holds a ton of moisture all by itself. Mm. And I think creates a moisture load, you know, in and of itself that you can make a really great argument that you need to deal with. And that dimple mat is going to basically do that for you. You just got to send it somewhere else. And you got to, like you said, vent it. Um, I don't think you, I don't even think you even need to vent it. The concrete is very happy being damp. It's going to cure over a thousand years and get stronger. Here's my argument. Come on, you're going to go to this trouble. Put the wine space a couple of feet away from the outside freaking wall. Well, yeah. Yeah, you say that. It's crazy, though. Some people like it's not. I don't know. You, Molly probably has crazy stories. I'm. I've done this a, a lot less time probably than than you have, or with a lot. Resi these types of residential clients dealt with them a lot less than you have, I'm sure. Same with Foster, but it's, uh, I'm getting really surprised at, to hear some of these um, requests. Like, I'm working it's on a 17,000 yeah. square foot house where the client want, doesn't want to finish the basement. They want an unfinished basement to save money. It's a 17,000 square foot house. And they're, uh, they don't want to finish the basement <laughs> to save. And the reason is, is to save money. This is you know, these aren't even, we're not even construction documents yet. We're like, if, if they're wanting to talk, talk value engineering at this stage, it's, 
I don't know. It's weird. Fine. Well, I, to give you another example. So, um, Florida is a swamp. You're not going to have a wine cellar in Florida because Florida is a swamp. Your wine space is going to be on top of the ground. And it makes no sense to be on the inside of an exterior wall. And you simply say, no. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. How, how does that work for you, Molly? Well, it's good for me to know because we can try to guide the clients to a different location. I hear from Foster. His advice to me is say, just always say yes. You figure it out later. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. is kind of the no, motto. No is a no, no is a no, no. Uh, yeah. yeah. Nah. I, okay. I, I don't have this problem anymore. I just say, no, it's a dumb one. You can't work. It doesn't stop this. You people are, and I say to them, you people are clever. You, you've got the best people in the world working for you. Figure out a way where this is not an outside wine. You, you can make this happen. Step back, take a deep breath and say, no, I'm not going to put it against you. And guess what? You, you laugh, Christy, but it's worked. I've well, I'm it. laughing because I'm working on a project right now with a wine cellar against an exterior wall that's partially below grade. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> They're not going to move it. I promise you they will well, but, not move okay. it. Okay, but this, I got a, a, a legit serious question here. So, and, and I think we've all probably experienced this. Like, it tends to be when I get involved with jobs, the way Christy is at the moment, like, They've already done their design, basically. They've already done their, their like program layout. It, where Joe, it sounds like you want to get involved like sort of prior to that. Like it, it, I, I, it, like you're advocating like, hey, there should be some general like guideline meeting prior to program layout. That sound about right? Well, yeah, but that comes with being a spectacularly beautiful and handsome and experienced architect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. We need to have all the architects listen to this and then we won't commit this mistake in the future. Well, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. Yeah, um, it is. Well, That's why it, we have building scientists come to our office and give presentations and educate us on this because it's important for us to be able to say no then. Well, so let, yeah. let, let, me, let me give you another example. We've learned because of bad mistakes when we build a hospital we don't put an operating theater against the outside wall or on the underside of an exterior room. we put it in the middle of the building if we're building an art gallery and we want to display french impressionist paintings we have a wing or a zone in, in the art gallery that's in the middle of the freaking art gallery or the rest of the freaking art gallery is a buffer space. So we get to provide the unique conditions for the French Impressionist paintings. Okay, I've got this magnificent wine collection. I mean, screw Renoir, I want Lafitte. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm going to want to protect it and have a buffer space around the perimeter. And guess what? You know, you, you, you start dealing with people that have these collections, they get it. They're not, they're not stupid. And it's a lot of fun dealing with them. And sometimes, yeah, I get called in late if I'm ever called in at all. And I say, okay, take a deep breath. Do you really want to do this? If you really want to do this, it's really complicated. What you could do is maybe everybody take a week or two off, go, you know, take a Valium or two, and then come back and rethink whether or not we can do this a little different. If you don't want to do it differently, it's going to be expensive and complicated. And I call it Clint East thermodynamics. Do you feel lucky? Well, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, so doctor, what's the largest wine storage room you think you've worked on? 
I'm not able to tell you this because of non-disclosure agreements. Mm. <laughs> but more than 100,000 bottles. Oh, okay. That's big. That's really big. Yeah. I thought 60,000 was a huge wine cellar. I saw that at a restaurant once. And they were touting themselves as like the, the, the largest wine cellar on, in New York or something like that. Well, New York is not as big as New York thinks it is. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. That's pretty cool. 100,000. Huh. Molly, you must have worked on some pretty cool ones. They're not that big, though. We have highly designed ones, I would say, and there's yeah, a lot yeah, of thought yeah. put into every single detail, but they're not necessarily the largest collections. Because a lot of times these are also one of many homes that people own. So they, they have part of their collection here, part of their collection there. Great point. That's, um, that's how I like to, to yeah, sell my I wine collection. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's only sensible. Actually brings up a, a, a question that I've been meaning to ask the doctor. Doctor, have you, have you ever had the opportunity to work on a wine storage room in a private jet? I mean, that's gotta be a thing, right? <laughs> Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I sense an article coming. <laughs> no. <laughs> there must be one out there somewhere though, right? Yes. And yachts, yachts That's... must be a thing with it too. Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah, well, wine storage and yachts, absolutely. Yachts <laughs> are, are uh, more of a concern than planes. Just let's change topics right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, where do you want to take it? What's your favorite oh. wine to store in wine cellars? <laughs> no, I'm going to say that old buildings you have to be really, really careful. And if you've got a really old building and you want to put in a special use area, don't put the special use area against any of the six, six surfaces of the exterior enclosure. Promise me, cross your heart, <laughs> lie, liar, liar, dance on fire in an old magnificent building don't do stupid stuff. Keep it away from the exterior surfaces. Please do this. It's enough. We have enough trouble giving old buildings another century or two without complicating things with insane internal loads. What about um, any considerations about lighting in these spaces and any heat that would come off or how you break the envelope that's insulated? Well, usually the lighting isn't on long enough to damage the lines because the only time we have lights are when people are in there. So it's really, I don't view lighting as a big, a big issue. Do you have to, um, but along those same lines, uh, does it help to have essentially a special service cavity? So you're you're minimizing penetrations for the for the lighting well i want to you want to disconnect everything from the existing system so you want you know, like one thing and out right you want to minimize the penetrations and you want to put as much of the stuff outside of the box so that the servicing happens outside huh yeah well, if I could interject, what I normally try to uh, specify is that the ceiling should be a hung ceiling, you know, some distance below the, you know, air, vapor, thermal control uh, layers. Now, having said that, uh, the problem I, I run into with wine storage rooms is the same problem I run into with natatoriums which are notoriously in basements is that you know 99 percent of of single family residences uh even in you know in 
in urban areas, they're moving their hot and cold air around through ductwork, which is enormous, and they run it through ceilings, and there's just no space. So it, it get you know you you get these crazy coordination issues where you know they want speakers and fancy lights and et cetera in their wine storage room and they're running you know 16 by 24 ductwork over top of it and it just gets to be a coordination nightmare so technically yeah i you know we we kind of know what to do but logistically it becomes very difficult so what do you do foster what do you end up usually doing uh, I just try to convince them to move the ductwork other places or <laughs> split systems or that sort of thing. If I'm lucky enough to get involved early. Um, otherwise, you kind of have this nightmare of origami insulation around, you know, your ductwork that you're trying to keep outside of this, uh, this wine room enclosure, but that, so, you know, is very I'm difficult. Gonna, I'm gonna jump in and I'm gonna say, you know, I just moved the freaking ductwork. Move the ductwork. Have I mentioned move? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there, 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 are certain, there are certain lines you don't, you don't cross, you know? You don't. So it's literally a line you don't cross, <laughs> so you keep the, <laughs> You keep the enclosure in in board of ductwork. Ductwork is exterior to the wine room enclosure. Is what you're saying? Move the duct. So don't don't pull man's cape. Don't spit into the wind, and don't pull the mask off of the Lone Ranger. <laughs> Words to live by. Um, well, speaking of the ductwork, though, um, we've always been talking about a four stair system that's feeding the wine room. Is there any particular arrangement of whether you should be supplying low, high, where the, um, that type of thing would be positioned in the room? Well, when you've got um, R20, the thermal resistance is so good, you've got more or less uniform conditions. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. So other than human argument. comfort, but other than human comfort, I guess if, oh, if the okay. room was occupied by people, you're, you're gonna you're gonna have so little temperature differential in that space. It's, it it won't it won't matter. The 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 big problem with people in the space is if you decide whether they deserve air or not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. If you're if if they're gonna be there for a freaking hour um as opposed to a couple of hours the amount of air changes is well, going to be speaking of air what if you were on a project that was at a high altitude would the oxygen content make any difference for the wine or would it be better with less or more i, I no it, it it the the size of the holes in the fr freaking wrapper is so the, small <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I don't think that's, I don't think that's an issue. It, as the chemical engineer in the room, I'm going to agree. It, it doesn't because it, that, but it's not worthy of, you know, of ten minutes of discussion. <laughs> but I would love a research grant to study this oh, and test the wine. Absolutely. I don't know why we stopped talking about wine rooms on private planes and yachts. That's, <laughs> that's where I think the research money is. Yeah. <laughs> yachts, yes, no. Interesting. All right, well, we're in about an hour here. I don't need to take up everybody's entire evening. So uh, unless, anybody's got some specific questions to go on. I just want to, I want to thank everybody. Uh, Christy, any questions? No, I have a comment. Go for it. Cheers. Yeah, there we go. Cheers. I only have water with me. <laughs> oh, <That's okay. laughs> I left my wine downstairs. It's too far away. Well, you have uh, a to-do list after we wrap yes. up. Yes. <laughs> Christy, let me, let me tell you what your grandfather told me about wine. 
What did he say? Great man that he was. He said, you should drink the wine that tastes good to you. Ignore what the experts say. Sage advice. Indeed. Hmm. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Stebrick. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Christy. Um, don't forget 